William Hopefully your favorite videographer from Two Hats Publishing. I welcome you to another Two Hats special of community events. Let's look in and see what's really happening. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Brian Price. I'm president of the LGBT Employee Association of Dallas. And on behalf of our LGBT employees and allies here with the city of Dallas, I'd like to welcome you to the unveiling of this beautiful and informative exhibit entitled Being Here, a look at the history of HIV AIDS in Dallas and its impact on the LGBT community. Uh, I'd, like to take you, I'd like to take the opportunity to invite you to a roundtable discussion later this month designed to complement this exhibit by focusing on the contemporary issues around HIV and AIDS in Dallas. We will have speakers from three nonprofits that serve clients with HIV and AIDS in, da in the city, the Resource Center, Abounding Prosperity, and Legacy Counseling, moderated by Patty Fink. The discussion will be taking place on Thursday, June 14th, 12 to 1 p.m., here in the City Hall Auditorium. You can find that event on Facebook as well. You are also invited to the LGBT Pride Month Award and Proclamation Ceremony on Wednesday, June 13th, 12 to 1 p.m., in the Flag Room on the sixth floor. This is an exciting community event, and it seems to be getting bigger every year. Uh, this is our second year to partner with UNT Special Collections and the Dallas Way for an LGBT Pride Month exhibit for the City Hall Lobby. I'm very grateful for the hard work the Special Collections Department has put into this exhibit, and to the Dallas Way for working diligently to collect and share the history of our community. Uh, I'd like to take a chance, if you're with UNT Special Collections Department, could you stand real quick and we can acknowledge you? And if you're with the Dallas Way, could you please stand? It is my belief that the city of Dallas is a wonderful place to work as a member of the LGBT community. And uh, it's become more that way over the years. Uh, just like the city and the region as a whole, this organization has grown by leaps and bounds because of the hard work of LGBT leaders, volunteers, elected officials, and staff. We hope that exhibits such as this and the continued expression of pride and inclusion will, will uh, encourage an affirming environment here at the city and ripple out into the community and civic culture. With that, I'm proud to introduce Deputy Mayor Pro Tem Adam Madrano, who leads our LGBT task force and has been a strong ally for our community. Hello, everyone. This is a great crowd. It's good to see a lot of people uh, that uh, are friends of uh, the community, allies, also uh, the LGBT community. Uh, happy to be here. I am excited that I uh, still chair um, the LGBT task force. Uh, I thought Omar, I'll try to pass it off to Omar, and he said no. <laughs> no, I didn't try to pass that off. I, I enjoy working with everyone. Uh, today marks the beginning of Pride Month. And I'm proud to be here with the LGBT Employee Association of Dallas and grateful for the hard work of the Dallas Way and the UNT Special Collections in putting together this much needed exhibit. While we spend this month celebrating contrib contributions of everyone within the LGBT community through parades, festivals, workshops, and concerts, it is important to note Pride Month began as a way to honor those lost in the 1969 Stonewall Riots in New York City. Those riots marked the start of a movement to outlaw discriminatory laws and abusive practices. When March P. Johnson, a black transgender bisexual woman, threw the first brick which started the Stonewall riots, but New York wasn't the only place a movement was growing. Several years before the Stonewall riots, Dallas established the Circle of Friends in 1965. It was the first organization in the city in which gays, lesbians, and allies gathered to confront issues in the community. We've come a long way since 1965, and we've won many battles for recognition and fair treatment, but we still have a long way to go. I'm, I'm proud that I chair the LGBT task force for the mayor. We've done amazing things. We've passed a citywide discrimination policy, pension benefits for same-sex partners, and uh, comprehensive transgender health care benefits for our employees here at the city of Dallas. Thank you. If you, if you are part of uh, the LGBT task force, will you please stand up? Because there's a lot of people that made a lot of this happen. I see some more over there, but uh, you got to stand up, trying to give you recognition. Thank you for all your work. 
Um, and uh, uh, I want to bring up my uh, colleague who uh, represents District 6 on the City Council, uh, Council Member Omar Narvaez. He's going to say a few words. <laughs> We've got some exciting news for tonight. So usually, and, and every year, we usually light up the Omni uh, rainbow and, and we get that done. But this time, we have three more participants. So we're going to have the Bank of America Tower, Thanksgiving Tower, uh, Hall Arts, KPMG Plaza, and the AT&T Plaza, along with the Omni. So that's going to be tonight. So it's going to be awesome, everyone. So uh, we're going to go somewhere to try to take a picture of it, and it's going to be a, a good time. So that's happening tonight. I also have a long list of events for Pride Month. Uh, you can get it from my office. We'll email it to you, but I'm going to put it over there if you want to see it. So we gathered that information, and we have it here. But again, I want to welcome everybody here, and thank you, uh, the Dallas Way and UNT Special Collections, for this exhibit. It's, it's an, another amazing exhibit. Um, we're going to announce. No, I know, but when's the event? The proclamation, June 13th? Thir 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 Sorry, we had to get uh, one thing clear so that I made sure I said it right. Um, welcome, everybody, and thank you, Deputy Mayor Pro Tem Medrano, for including me in this celebration. This is something that's obviously important to me, um, being um, you know, one of the openly gay council members, the first openly gay council member elected in over a decade in the city of Dallas. And so this Pride Month means even more to me than I think the others have. Um, I've, I'm a longtime member of the LGBT task force. I think I was there maybe two or three months after it was started by um, Councilwoman Delia Hasso. And um, I was really excited when um, Mayor Pro, Deputy Mayor Pro Tem Medrano took it over, um, before, obviously before I was on the council. And under his leadership, more stuff has been done in this city in such a short period of time than in any other you know, uh, period of time in our city's history. So for that, I want to give you thanks and congratulations. When it comes to the lighting of, um, of the city, um, I think uh, Pam Gerber, do you remember we, we had that one meeting and Ms. Hasso had asked us, everybody put your dream. What is your dream for the city to do something? And one of the dreams was to have the pride flag displayed inside of City Hall. And it went from the flag room to now, you know, we'll be unveiling it, I think, for the second time here in the lobby. And, you know, we couldn't get the one out there. We, we wanted that one. But unfortunately, there, there's just some technical stuff we just can't get past to get it done. Um, but maybe one day, you know, you never know. Um, and then, but my dream was to light up something in the city in rainbow colors and of course we want to do the Margaret Hunt Hill Bridge and then we found out that we would have to raise about $30,000 to get the cells to do it and I said you know for that kind of a dream I'd rather raise $30,000 and get it to a nonprofit that's helping our LGBT youth or LGBT seniors or something to that effect you know um, and then uh, I don't remember what happened but it was kind of one of those things I woke up in the middle of the night and I think I called Pam actually or Patty I don't know who it was and was like, oh my God, we own the Omni. The Omni needs to be lit up in rainbow colors. And, um, and it, it was a lot of work. It was a hassle. But um, this guy in his first year when he took over the LGBT task force, he made that dream happen. And here we are, your fifth year, and he's got the whole darn city lighting up. So thank you for that as well. This is really exciting as well because um, Texas Bear Roundup is actually here for the weekend. They're launching today. So we're going to get to show people all across Texas that are here and probably the nation that are here for this weekend um, how Dallas celebrates pride. So they'll get to see it. And I also want to point out some very special guests that are here that I noticed out in the um, audience. We have our city attorney, Larry Casto, who's in the very back. Thank you, city attorney, for being here. We have um, former mayor pro tem John Loza. There he is right there in the back. We also have Aaron Moore here representing Commissioner um, uh, Teresa Daniels' office over here to the right. And um, it, it, uh, obviously, I'm, I saved it last because I think he's the best Parkland board member, maybe because he's been my partner for a little over 22 years. But uh, Mr. Jesse Vallejo, Parkland board member, is in the back as well. So with that, I want to thank you all and thank you, um, Deputy Mayor Pro Tem, again for your leadership and the success that you, you've accomplished in your five years here, but also to the task force 
Uh, many of you have been great partners with me over the years and continue to diligently work. And then to everybody else, everybody's here for a reason. You've done your part, whether it was writing a check, voting at the polls, helping somebody get to uh, you know, something that they needed to get done, helping somebody back when the HIV AIDS crisis was happening. There are so many stories in this room, and that's why we celebrate Pride, is because of everything each um, one of you have done and that we will all continue to do until we have full equality in this country. Thank you very much. Uh, next, I'd like to welcome Morgan Geringer from UNT Special Collections to speak on behalf of the exhibit. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you so much for being here. I'm so excited to see so many people here, and I'm so excited that we have so much to celebrate during Pride Month. But I think as we're we're celebrating all of these important victories that have happened. It's also important to look back at the past and recognize where we have come from. Um, and that's what we do every day at UNT Special Collections. The LGBT archive um, contains over 30 collections at this point, and that includes very large collections such as Resource Center and the Dallas Voice Archive, but, as well, but also personal collections such as Bill Nelson and Don Baker organizational records like the Texas Human Rights Foundation and the Texas Stonewall Democratic Caucus. These are the collections that we preserve and provide access to every day um, on the UNT Denton campus, but also the collections we use to present um, exhibits such as the one we're presenting here today. A lot of the collections that we've been able to preserve in the archive have come to us through our partnership with the Dallas Way. The Dallas Way has been uh, partnering with us for almost five years now, um, and our partnerships involve acquiring materials for the archive, but also the very important work of raising the funds that is necessary to digitize those materials to provide widespread access to them through the portal to Texas history. The Dallas Way also provides support for projects such as this, so we'd like to thank the Dallas Way today also for providing the financial support to actually print all of the exhibit panels that you're seeing, um, as well as their support in helping us to actually construct the narrative of this exhibit. Um, the Dallas Way members, as members of the LGBT, LGBT community in Dallas, um, really help us to understand the materials that we're working as we attempt to preserve them for the archive. I want to tell everyone about one collection that we're featuring here in this exhibit, and that's the collection of the Dallas chapter of the NAMES Project. The NAMES Project is a national organization that's responsible for the AIDS memorial quilt. The Dallas chapter was the group that was responsible for constructing the quilt squares to memorialize people who died of AIDS in Dallas. Um, during the course of their organization, they created over 800 quilt squares. This group was active within a church, the White Rock Community Church in Dallas. Um, and they met there, they held their meetings there, they created the quilt panels there. But when this organization disbanded, their archive was just kind of put away in a closet and no one remembered where it was, no one knew it was there. And it was not until that church started a renovation that it was found. And it was one person who recognized what these materials were, who called the archive. I came, I looked at them, I immediately recognized what they were, how important they were to preserve. The archive included photographs of every quilt square they created, as well as every time the quilt squares were displayed in Dallas and Washington, D.C. And those materials were able to be saved. But that is just an example of how fragile our history and our memories can be. That, you know, if things had gone differently, if somebody else had opened that closet, those things could have just as easily been tossed into a dumpster. The 
purpose of an archive is to preserve and make materials available to the public, um, primarily for scholarly research, and we've done a good job of that. We now have over 6,000 items from the LGBT collections that are online and fully searchable in the portal to Texas history. But an archive serves a deeper purpose, and that is to form our collective memory from which future generations will learn about the events of the past. An archive is said to be the raw materials of history. And without those raw, mater without those raw materials, the history can be lost. To preserve these type of materials requires the trust and support of the community that we are trying to document. And I want to thank the Dallas Way for um, having that trust in us to preserve this history. Um, and that trust in us to continue the partnership um, which we have started. I'd also like to thank Brian Price and the LGBT Employees Association for giving us the opportunity pr to present this Pride Month exhibit. Um, I am looking forward to being here this time next year. Um, and I'd also like to thank um, the Dallas Way again um, for providing all of the things that they do to help us get to the place we are today. I would be remiss without thanking my special collections staff, um, especially Jamie Parker, who is our exhibits coordinator, who spent um, hours upon hours of her time actually creating this exhibit, um, and our student graphic designer, Tyler Cogburn, um, who provided the amazing um, design that you see here today. And just as a side note, Tyler is graduating. So um, if anybody out there is hiring, <laughs> communications, marketing, graphic design, he's on the market, just saying. <laughs> Thank you all again for being here today. Um, it is really heartwarming to see so many people here to help us celebrate, and um, happy Pride Month. Thank you, Morgan. I'm about to introduce the Dallas Way, uh, who will also introduce some speakers. Uh, but I just wanted to let everyone know that um, after that part of, the, part of the program is done, we're going to be unveiling the Pride flag to welcome in Pride Month. So please stay uh, till the very end for that. Uh, next, I'd like to welcome uh, my good friend and the president of the Dallas Way, Dr. Evelu Prejan. Thank you, Brian. Um, and thank you, Morgan, and your team for this amazing work. You have um, proven your trust um, that, that we've put into you, and it was um, just amazing. I had the opportunity, actually, to tour the special collections and go behind the scenes and see how they do all these things. And it was amazing. I was so impressed and happy. And, if that makes me a nerd, then just call me a nerd. But I loved it all. It was great. Um, you do fabulous work, and I want to thank you for that. I also want to thank Brian and the LGBT Association of the City of Dallas. Without y'all, this wouldn't happen. And um, Brian is also a board member of the Dallas Way and has brought lots of new ideas and has stretched our imagination and in many ways that you will find and you will know about soon. Um, silence equals death. Silence equals death. That was a mantra that we heard and stated over and over again back in the day. While our friends, our brothers, nephews, uncles, partners and lovers were dying, no one in power was speaking about the effects of the horrible disease. So it was up to us to speak truth to that power. It still is true today, if not more so, as it was back then. In today's climate of antagonism toward and fear of the disenfranchised and the minor other minorities, who seek to silence us, sharing our history means we won't be silenced. And we will keep the memories of those we lost alive. 
We must tell our history so that the future can be informed and lead us to a better tomorrow. It's important that we all remember and that we never forget. I would now like to introduce one of my heroines, heroes, whom I'm also very fortunate to call my friend. Penny Crispin was one of the first medical professionals to step up and step in to stem the tide of death. She administered treatment to HIV AIDS patients knowing that she was placing herself and her career in jeopardy. She helped many to live and she held the hands of others while they faced their death. Penny Crispin. Hi. My name is Penny Pickle Crispin, and I would like to open this moment with a thought from Matthew regarding this, our legacy, and what we teach our children. Matthew 18.6 says, but whosoever misleads one of these little ones that believes in me, it would be better for him that a millstone was hanged on his neck and he were sunk in the depths of the sea. To me, that great millstone around our nation's neck has been the weight of prejudice and indifference. Sorry about my shaky voice. I'm one of three children born in Greenville, Texas, a town known for its motto, the blackest land, the whitest people. We three grew up in the area of prejudice and segregation with the understanding as white, somewhat upper middle class for the standards of Greenville, that we were born into privilege. Our grandfather was a Baptist minister, our father a lay minister, and I received my nursing degree from Baylor University. And all was well and proper until my sister Ginevra's wedding reception in the May of 1992 when my brother collapsed with a high fever and pneumocystis pneumonia. We were suddenly removed from our privileged pinnacle to our own line of separation and took our place as a gay man struggling with AIDS and his lesbian sister. I was an ICU nurse working at Methodist Hospital with a gay next door neighbor named Graham McLean who was also a resident at Methodist. He told me about an aerosol treatment for pneumocystis pneumonia being tested in San, uh, San Francisco and said that it could prevent and treat the pneumonia and save lives. We quickly formed a small health care company delivering these treatments door to door, somewhat surging to the forefront of Dallas home care because of the hesitance of our competitors to care for homosexuals. While our government local authorities and even Parkland sat debating the ob obligation and expense of treating and devoting money to research and treatments to save our beautiful community. The Dallas Gay Alliance wasted no time in taking control of the situation. They purchased pentamidine and asked me to administer it at the AIDS Resource Center, Nelson Thibodeau Clinic, named for my patients and dear friends Bill Nelson and Terry Thibodeau. It's hard to articulate now that time capsule that I so vividly remember, but if, imagine if you can my great honor to go into the most warm and beautifully decorated condos and homes in DFW with the most handsome, articulate, and talented men in the universe to try to deliver life-sustaining treatments to teachers, doctors, artists, decorators, lawyers, and other business leaders as well as my own beloved brother. It was a terrible time, but such an uplifting time to be able to assist in bringing comfort, sight-saving antivirals, and pain control to the community I love so deeply. Contrast that against the government's slow motion denial and arguments against our elected, amongst our elected leaders not only about the expense and magnitude of what a proper response would entail, but whether in fact gay lives were worth it. And indeed it brought many of us out of the closet and out of the shadows, exposing us for who we really were. It pushed us out before our families and coworkers so that choices were presented all over the country and the world about who would love us and who would support us 
and who would turn their backs on us in our time of need. Eventually, every person in America was touched by the virus in one way or another, and the measurement of our worth as a people was in our ability to drop the lines of separation and offer our whole selves to the crisis for which we were confronted. And our task today is to carry on that memory and that commitment and to love each other unconditionally and to support any fallen brother whenever we can. To forget this time or this lesson is to bury the memories of the millions of men, women, and children whose lives were lost to HIV and those we had the privilege of knowing and serving. It's still hard. Who could ever forget seeing their courage and love for us? That time of judgment by our parents and others and being ostracized by some was a deeply hurtful time for my brother and I when we were at the hardest point of our lives. It was not lost on either of us that others bear this burden for the color of their skin, their religion, and so many other human conditions, not just for a capsule of time, but for a lifetime. It was truly inconceivable. To hold prejudice in our hearts today is to render a time of deep emotion and spiritual growth and love to the ash heap of human greed and selfishness and to the support of fear and abandonment of our fellow man. Let us remember this time in our community's history. Let us remember the brave and courageous people who died and let them not have died in vain. Let us honor them by placing our judgments, our prejudices, and our lines of separation squarely behind us and step to the altar of human kindness. May we honor those who loved and served the HIV community and teach our children the value of each life, each person, and the rich reward of loving one another. And let us give our brothers and sisters living today with HIV every fiber of love and undying hope we have. Thank you. And now you know why she's one of my heroes. The Dallas Way, the mission of the Dallas Way is to gather, organize, store, and present the history of the LGBT community in Dallas. And that's why we have partnered with UNT and their special collections. And we are so encouraged by them and encouraged and grateful for their friendship and their trust in us and our trust in them. Now I would like to introduce someone that I've known for 30 years, as long as I've known Penny. God, we're old. Um, Gary and I met at Oaklawn Counseling Center, soon to be known as Oaklawn Community Services. He served as the head of all of our HIV AIDS services and ultimately as, is, as the OLCS executive director. Gary presided over, directed all of our services, which included transportation to the hospital and to doctor's appointments, prescription pickup and delivery for patients who were too sick to wait in line at Parkland, the Dare Center, named after Harry, Howie Dare, another of our heroes. It was an adult daycare center where guys could come and talk and visit and socialize and get a hot meal while they were there. I'm sure there are many other services I've already forgotten about, but we, we did everything, it seems like, and did all we could. And Gary was the one who led them. So I would like to introduce Another one of my heroes, Mr. Gary Swisher. Okay. There's the podium. Right there. Okay, there's the 
microphone. I'm sure the sound guys are really going to appreciate this. Here comes the blind guy. He's going to hit everything. Okay. Um, thank you. And Penny, you're an act to follow, let me tell you. Oh, my God. Uh, hi, everybody. Thanks for the chance to come and talk. <clears throat> I came to Dallas in 1984 from uh, Midland. There was nothing going on in Midland. But it was a nice, quiet little place. And from before that, I was in New Mexico. Really quiet little place. We came to Dallas, to the big city, and fell into the gay community. It was like magic. Um, never seen so much activity, so many people, so many places. It was exciting and it was fun and uh, could get a little tiring. But it was uh, the beginning of the, the AIDS crisis. It hadn't really impacted me or any of my friends before I got to Dallas. And then being gay in the gay community with the AIDS crisis, it was like dancing in an open field during a lightning storm. You never knew where it was going to hit, but you sure was going to hit. And maybe you, maybe the person next to you, or maybe not at all. Uh, there was a sense of urgency, a sense of anger, a fear, not only within the community, but uh, against the community. We were afraid of each other. We were afraid of this illness, this disease. Back then it was HTLV3. We didn't have HIV. And we had GRID. We didn't have AIDS. And um, people were dying at an alarming rate and were being blamed for whatever happened to them. They got what they deserved. To me, that was the biggest waste of human resources I'd ever seen, and I could not fathom feeling this way about a fellow human being. There was an ad one day in the Dallas Voice, and Oakland Counseling Center was having a training, and they wanted volunteers to come work with people with HTLV3 and AIDS. And I thought, well, this is a chance to do something. I'll see what this is about. So I went to the house on Nash Street. Back then we were in a little house on Nash Street. Mike Grossman's here. He was chair of the board at that time. And I walked in into a room where I thought there'd be a few people, and there were 30 people sitting there talking. They were all volunteers, and they were there to start the Buddy Project. And Howie Dare had created this program he had traveled around the country, talked to his friends and other agencies and other programs to see how they were helping support people who had AIDS and how they were focusing on the activities of daily living and just helping them to cope how to live and how to face their death because we didn't know what the chances were at that time. It was rough, but it was rewarding. You got to be so close to really figure out what, what life was really all about, what was important and what wasn't. You know, leave it to the gays. You give them a budget and a mission and they'll get it done. And a lot more colorfully than most people would. So we decided to get a little more organized. And as our numbers grew of more and more cases, of people calling saying, I need help. And more and more people were being thrown out of their hands by families who didn't understand or were afraid. And more and more companies calling saying, we've got somebody who's sick and we don't know what to do. Or we're afraid we might find out if someone's sick and we don't know what to do. How do we protect ourselves? It was very clear that in addition to physical assistance and the services, we had to do education. We had to learn as much as we could from whatever source we could. And we got a lot of that from the CDC, who contracted to Dallas County Health Department, who started outreach programs to do education. And so we 
we joined forces with them. We set up a hotline, tried to put out as much positive and accurate information that we could get. At the same time, we started training anybody who would listen and uh, developing more and more of a structured program to provide, to provide the physical support. We also saw that there was other needs as printed listed. We found people who they couldn't get to the doctors if a doctor would see you. We couldn't get to the hospital or, you know, like Penny had to go to their homes. So transportation was an issue. It's an issue in Dallas, even if you're healthy. So we had to do something about that. We got an old van donated, didn't have any brakes, but we used it and we started hauling people back and forth. I can't tell you how many times I'd be picking up someone from Parkland who had their chemo and threw up in the car, but you did what you had to do. We were having people who couldn't be home alone and their partners or their family members were losing time from work using up their vacation, using up their sick leave, so they could stay home and take care of somebody. Well, that wasn't going to work either. So we created the adult daycare center, the DARE center, and gave them a place to go during the day. We tag team with the Visiting Nurse Association, and they would come and do health, che health checks and check medications and make sure they got a, a, a good hot meal. And we took care of them, a place to take a nap, and we'd cart them back home so that their loved ones could go on with life. It was an important thing. The other organizations were popping up in, in everywhere. DGA expanded their services to create the food pantry and pet panels. And children became an issue. So uh, Tim Emanuel got involved. And there was the creation of Brian's House to deal with women and children with AIDS. And, uh, with Children's Medical Center and Barbara Cambridge from UT and UT Southwest Medical Center, started working with women and children. We all had to organize together and finally got some help. We got the Ryan White Care Act money, and we got the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation demonstration grant money, and created the hub system, which created AIDS Arms, a central clearinghouse and case management system. The PWA coalition themselves expanded and became aid services of Dallas and created housing. We did what we had to do. You found a need, you figured out how to fix it, or at least address it, and you did what you could. You begged for money, you did a drag show, you did a big show, a big sale, you did whatever you could, and you wrote grants. And that's how we got along. And it grew and it became one of the more successful organizations and structures within the country and it became a demonstration project for the rest of the country. We go through conferences in San Francisco and LA and New York and Washington. They weren't doing a lot of the stuff that we were doing or they were doing it in a very segmented way. Dallas doesn't do it that way. That's not the Dallas way. I have to tell you, I'm very proud of Dallas. We have done more than many of the places had. We did it successfully. And as services were no longer needed, they fell by the wayside, and that's okay. We evolved. We kept going on to do what we needed to do as we needed it, and when it was no longer necessary, we let it go. That's what seemed to be the, way, the best way to do it. So that's what we did. Age is still an issue. It will always be an issue. It's a chronic issue now. It's a chronic illness. I would love for the day when it's no longer an illness, period. It has taken so much. You quit going to funerals after so many friends and family members have died. You just quit going to the funerals. You couldn't handle it anymore. It has taken so much. It's taken a lot for me. It took my sight. It's taken part of my colon. My kidneys are crumbling as we speak, but I'm still here, and I'm still fighting. I'm still kicking, alive and kicking, maybe not quite as high as I used to, not quite as gracefully as I used to, but we're still kicking. And that's, I believe, in part due to what was available to me in Dallas. That's the Dallas way. Thanks. Don't forget it.
keep it up. And maybe we'll see you again next June. Thank you. Thanks again to all of our speakers and their thoughtful message. Um, one more reminder, if you'd uh, like to join us uh, on Thursday, June 14th, we're going to have a roundtable discussion looking at the evolution and continuing ongoing issues of HIV AIDS in Dallas. That'll be here at City Hall. Uh, also a reminder, join us the day before, Wednesday, June 13th, for our Pride Month award and proclamation ceremony. Um, now uh, I'd like to invite your attention up to the walkway, we're about to unveil the pride flag. Uh, grab some refreshments. We have some sandwiches and cookies and punch available. And I'm going to invite a few folks to join me up to unveil the flag.